pick the alert and talk that mass the team. Do not adversely affect each and every sector. Any sort of ideology. Just in this great location for Nepal to explore its potential. Namaste. Welcome to Nepal's Top 7 Debaters 2014, produced by Leadership Academy. In today's episode, we are featuring the journey from competition to final round of the winner of Nepal's Top 7 Debaters 2014, Category 7, Special Mention, Mr. Prasanna Zangthapa of Grade 12 from St. Xavier's College. Human and drug traffickers should be entitled to that sentence. First of all, I see so many figures being branded about here. 200,000 people who have been trafficked away from Nepal. Now imagine every 200,000, every 10 people are trafficked by a single person. Now we start killing those people. What would happen to the population of this country if we start killing 200,000 or 20,000 people? Imagine the economic costs that it would take. It is simply not believable. It is simply not possible. And how, why should we not kill people? First of all, there's the talk of human rights. You see, in 1997, Nepal uh, ratified an international convention of civil and political rights. And by doing that, what Nepal effectively did was it illegalized uh, killing people. It illegalized giving death penalties. And why did we illegalize giving death penalties? Because we believe that every single person has an equal right to live. We believe that it doesn't matter if you're the prime minister or the magistrate. It doesn't matter if you're a farmer or a doctor. You deserve to live. And that is why we cannot kill people. They have a certain uh, right to live. The, another, another thing is, currently in the laws of Nepal, the maximum crime, the maximum punishment anyone can be given is 20 years in prison. Now, see, a murderer is given 20 years in prison and a drug trafficker is killed? Is that even logical? It's not, right? So, uh, you have to look at the current state of our country, you have to look at uh, the international scenario, and you have to conclude that no, killing people is not right, no, killing people for any reason is not right, and especially for an offence such as drug trafficking and human trafficking, although they must be condoned, is not right. Thank you. For the grade 10, 11 and 12, I would think uh, you can do much better than today. In 2012 and 2013, uh, this category has been the most competitive among all the six uh, categories we have. So I would say that uh, most of you could not convince us either way, whether we should give a death penalty to the traffickers of humans and drugs or whether we should not. And even the data has varied from one person to another. So, uh, you know, the data has to be correct. When you debate, you can't just throw any figure. Some of you have mugged up your uh, debate. That should never happen in a debate competition. You can have your notes and data just to support your, not to guide you. Counter argument was almost none. So, you know, you ha all, in a debate, you always have to listen to what your opponents have to say. And if you're the first one, you have to pre-calculate what counter arguments would be coming up and that's how you become a smart smart debater asking questions some of you did that in English debate you don't ask questions in Nepali debate it makes an impact but we're not here to answer your questions <laughs> we're here to judge you and we can't judge you if you start asking us questions right so also for one or two of the debaters uh, use a gender balanced language like he his is not enough no you have to use he or she you know, you have to bring the both the genders in, into the context. So some of you uh, who are going to make it to the next round, uh, please work hard and maintain the standard of this category. You guys uh, actually presented a lot of enthusiasm. There were certain um, good reasoning and evidences that were portrayed. Um, but in some, you know, when you source, the, uh, when you have a certain source, the sources were not quoted. So it would be really nice to know where you actually got the information or data from. And it's more Im informative. And in some, um, I think it was not that convincing. I sort of um, had, you sort of engaged me in the beginning, but then uh, the enthusiasm and the engagement sort of fluttered in the end. The confidence, I would say, was not that great. Uh, some of you portrayed a lot of confidence, but uh, in some, I could not see that. And uh, second of all, the points of information put forward by uh, most of the debate participants, um, 
it was so so it was not that convincing um well thank you very much thank you to all of you i i thought uh contrary to what the other judges said you all did really really well um there are areas where there could be some improvement which i'll talk about but i thought you were brilliant it's very hard to get up there and and talk in front of the cameras uh, to judges that you, you don't know. So I thought you were fantastic. So keep up the good work. Uh, you all did a lot of research. Clearly, you prepared. You were well-spoken. Um, you made logical arguments in most cases. So well done. I think the, the group that were arguing against the motion had the easier task, actually, because it's harder to, um, to argue for the death penalty when you're protecting human rights, when that is in itself, I think, a, clearly a, a breach of human uh, rights. But the uh, the group that argued for did, did extremely well. There were a few areas where I thought um, I could have learned more from you. Uh, one was the economics of all of this. Of course, there is a justice um, component to this and a human rights component. But, but economically, if you look at the countries that do have the, the death penalty, like the US, it's hugely expensive. Uh, actually, it's much more expensive because most of these people stay on death row for their entire lives anyway than it is to have some kind of, kind of restorative process of justice. So you could have touched on the economics of it. Um, also, the capacity of the legal system to deal with this. You, some of you brought up this idea that, that people could be executed by mistake, um, that they perhaps weren't guilty. Does the legal system in Nepal, for example, does it have the capacity to deal with these cases effectively? Um, you also tended, most of you, to focus on Nepal, but the question was actually much broader than that. And it would have been good to, to th look at some other countries. I think it was Tanvi mentioned the Philippines, which was good. You know, I would have liked to have heard some stuff from elsewhere. A few points very quickly on techniques. I think you should make sure you use all the time you have. There are a couple of you that, that didn't quite do that. You should definitely speak slowly. Um, mostly you are quite good at that, but it's always worth reiterating. Um, use your hands and eye contact with us in order to emphasize your points. I thought uh, Shrijan was, was very good at that. Um, statistics, again, I would say make sure you quote what source they're coming from. Otherwise, it, it seems like you're picking them out of thin air. Yogesh was good at that. Tanvi was, was good at that as well. Make emotional appeals to us. I think facts are good, but emotional appeals convince people better. Uh, Ruchit, you were, you were good at that. And uh, keep the language logical and formal. Don't ever drop into sort of slang, which a couple of you did at, at one point. But overall, fantastic. Well done. And, uh, and keep up the good work. We're not going to rank you today because it's just eight of you and we'll have to let two of you go today. I'll announce the name of two of you and I will wish you best wishes for your life and for your future debating, right? And the rest six of you who are going to do the next round, all the best. And please work harder than, than you are doing right now. Yogesh and Dasan, we'll have to let you go from today's competition. Uh, Yogesh and Dasan, please come forward. And rest of you, um, best wishes for the future ones. Nepal should invest in nuclear power. There are many reasons why Nepal should not invest in nuclear power. The first reason why Nepal should not invest in nuclear power is because of the economic factor. Let me give you some data. According to the World Bank, the GDP of Nepal is around $19 billion, while the energy requirement in Nepal is roughly around 1,000 megawatts of electricity. Now, according to a report published, the cost needed to produce 1,000 megawatts of electricity using nuclear power is around $6 billion to $9 billion. Now that is nearly half of national GDP. Is it feasible? Is it feasible in a country where 25% of the people live below the poverty line, a data given by the World Bank? Is it possible where people die daily due to lack of food, due to lack of medicine? It is not possible. Economically speaking, Nepal cannot afford nuclear power. The next reason why Nepal should not um, uh, make or create nuclear power is because there is a better alternative and that alternative is hydropower. Different researchers have shown that the total capacity of Nepal to produce electricity using hydropower is about 40,000 megawatts of electricity, 40 times the current need. And I'll give you another example. In the upper uh, Karnali uh, hydropower plant, there was an investment of around a billion dollars. And with the investment of billion dollars, there will be an investment of billion dollars. And with the investment of a billion dollars, we are looking to create 900 megawatts of electricity. So on the one hand, we have nuclear power, which is about six to nine times more expensive than hydropower. Hydropower is long lasting. Hydropower is cleaner.
The next thing I'd like to talk about is the fuel required in uranium, uh, sorry, fuel, fuel required in nuclear power, as well as the manpowers needed to create nuclear power. You see, uh, there's this assumption that Nepal has plenty of uranium, plenty of uh, plutonium, but that's just an assumption. The fact is there is not a single uranium nor a single plutonium mine in Nepal, the fuel needed to create nuclear power. Another fact is Nepal does not possess enough manpower to create nuclear power. So what we see in Nepal is that there is a lack of uh, manpower as well as fuel. So I'd like to conclude saying that Nepal does not have enough, uh, enough economy to uh, invest in nuclear power. It does not have enough um, manpower, nor does it have enough fuel to invest in nuclear power. So Nepal should not invest in nuclear power. Thank you. Today's debate was not engaging. It's a, it's a topic that can engage any audience in any country. Right? It's a global debate. It's not a very difficult topic at all. But, you know, we, as a judge, I was very disoriented because the contents were not clear. It was like uh, listening to an essay or a public speaking, and that too you have mugged up. So when you have mugged up, it becomes very difficult when you're nervous, you know, because it kind of holds you back. I think that you all um, did a really great job despite um, some of the criticisms. I think that you, um, it's important to show that you've done a lot of research and to really cite the sources um, that you've, of the information that you found. And I've found that the most powerful um, speeches so far covered um, statistics. And, um, and I think that it's also important that you don't pause and like you're recollecting a script, but just keep going and try to really engage the audience like Santosh was saying. But overall, well done. Uh, I think you did very well, uh, all of you. Um, I think it's uh, impressing. Uh, it impressed me that uh, youngsters like you, you uh, actually, you're concerned about uh, a topic like nuclear energy. I mean, uh, in Denmark, the youth uh, of, of your age, they're mostly watching X Factor, and uh, they, they don't get involved in... Uh, in political uh, issues like this. So I, I think that you did very well. I'm impressed. I think that uh, you could maybe have talked a bit about, a bit more about the risks of uh, earthquakes uh, in Nepal because there is a history of that and everybody is like fearing the next one. Uh, you have a history with Bhaktapur in 34 and uh, that that I would have liked to have that as as part of um, of your argumentation, and I think that the the human risks um, are also a very important factor when you talk about nuclear energy. Because when we look at Chernobyl in eighty six and uh, Fukushima in two thousand eleven, ten thousands, if not hundred thousands, of people have lost their homes and have been evacuated, and we still have around a hundred thousand people in. Fukushima, who can't go back because the government fear uh, the consequences. Uh, so there are some consequences of nuclear power that I would have liked to hear more about. But overall, I think you did very well. There are two things that have been said by my opponents that I completely disagree with. First of all, there was a saying that nuclear power is an investment for the future. Well, it's kind of an oxymoron because every investment is for the future. See, when we talk about nuclear power being, uh, being an investment for the future, so is hydropower. If we invest in the hydropower, we get electricity for eons to come. What I'm trying to say is that whenever we invest in something, we do it for the future. And another thing that I'd like to comment on is that we cannot invest for the future right now when we don't have the investment for today. We need to invest for today first, and then can we think about the future. Let's first of all make sure that we, our uh, present is good enough, then let's think about the uh, future. Now the second point is the reliability of all other forms of energy. You see, uh, my opponents almost um, said, almost stated that all other forms of energy are not reliable enough. They are reliable enough. We get energy electricity today, not enough because we don't have enough hydropower stations, but we still get electricity today because of those hydropower stations. What, we, what that shows is that hydropower stations are reliable if there are enough. So with this, I'd like to end my rebuttal. Thank you. Well, the good news for you all today is uh, there's going to be no elimination because two of our debaters, Sivani Misra and Ayusha Adhikari, backed out for this competition. And it's kind of sad to lose them because I judged them last time. They both are very good debaters and I'm sure they could have 
if they try, they could have made it to the semi-final round. So that's saying uh, I have to provide something today. So for the first time in 2014, I'm going to give you the ranks. We all judges have agreed that uh, Tanvi Agrawal was the best in today's uh, debate. Whereas last time Tanvi, you struggled. It's a very good uh, improvement. Ruchit Shrestha, we, we have ranked you second. And uh, the major reason is your rebuttal was very good. Your first presentation, you struggled. And uh, third is Prasanna Zang Thapa. You're very good with the first competition, but in the rebuttal, you really slowed down in, in your pace, in your presentation, in your content. So you have to try to balance. Uh, because if you go to the final, you know, there will be four rounds. So, so you could do the first one, then if you miss the th next three ones. And then Srijan, uh, you were the fourth today. Uh, you really have to work very hard. You know, it's next competition is going to be very tough. So you really have to work very hard. You know, it's it's a good thing you're in the semi-final. It's a very deciding uh, next competition. If uh, whoever makes it, you know, it'll be countries first and second. So right now it's still countries on top four. So that's not that bad. <laughs> but uh, you really have to work very hard for the next time. All the best. Traditional technology should be mandatory for construction in Nepal. Traditional technologies, they have many advantages. That point I will concur. But the thing we need to realize here is the disadvantages of traditional technologies. We need to realize that the disadvantages of t tra using traditional technologies far outweighs the small advantages that they have. Let me begin with the idea of construction. Why do we construct things? We construct things so that they last and provide a certain objective to us, provide homes or temples or something like that. And our objective while constructing them is to make sure that they last that they are durable and that they are strong. So now let me compare the two technologies, construction by two technologies. First of all, old technologies, and second, we have modern new technologies. Um, first of all, before I go there, let me define technology. Technology, people have assumed, only means tools and machineries. That is not the case. Technology also means the techniques used in construction. It also means the construction materials used. So uh, let me talk about my durability and strength point. You see, I have two bridges. One is made out of concrete, and the other one is made out of bamboo. Which one do you think will last longer? Of course, the concrete one, right? It will be more strong, it will be more durable. When we use traditional technology, we ru run a risk of being not enough durable, of the uh, construction not being enough durable, and the construction not being strong enough. I'd like to go to another point that uh, my friend has also talked about, about time, money, and manpower. You see, Traditional technologies have huge advantages in time, money, and manpower compared to modern technology. So I have given you five points about strength, technology, money, time, and manpower. All five of these points are quintessential in today's construction works. Now, let me go to some of the points that my opponents have claimed. First of all, uh, my opponents have claimed that uh, traditional technology makes Nepal uh, more uh, sustainable. Right. Um, I'd like to uh, question that point because currently, according to the World Bank, Nepal is losing 1.5 rupees a day in trade deficit. That is not sustainable development. Until now, we have been using traditional technologies. We need to go away from that. That data shows that we need to go away from traditional technology and towards modern technology. My opponents also made uh, a point of uh, how handicrafts and carpets are being used, are being exported from Nepal. But I'd like to point out that those are not construction works. Our debate is about construction works in uh, technology used in construction works. Uh, carpets are not exactly construction works. I'd also finally like to point out, what if I'm a businessman and I want to create a skyscraper? I want to make a skyscraper for my business. Will I be able to make that skyscraper using traditional technology? The simple answer is no. So instead of making traditional technology mandatory, and the key word here is mandatory, what we should be doing is we should be letting the uh, construction workers choose. Choose the technology which is appropriate for whichever construction work they're doing. If they're making huge skyscrapers, we should let them use modern technology. If they are building things like temples, we should let them use traditional technology. So I'd like to conclude saying that traditional technologies have the advantages. However, the disadvantages that I have talked about of traditional technology being made mandatory far outweighs the advantages. Thank you. Quite a diversity of techniques among the four of you. Um, I think the first speaker just needs to work on being more fluid with your argument. The second speaker, uh, yeah, very good presentation skills. Another good point um, was that you seemed to believe in what you were saying. Um, the third speaker, I would say you have a very determined presentation skill, but sometimes that can alienate the listener 
whereas the last person that spoke had a, a very more relaxed presentation skill, which was easier to listen to. I think overall you were covering as a group many of um, the key issues, but I didn't find one of you with a really coherent argument which followed through all the way through. The last speaker I liked, the way that you gave an example, that's, that's very good, but then you need to back it up with evidence. And I think when you're talking um, for and against technology, it's very easy to uh, lump all of points into good and bad, you know, whether it's uh, about sort of culture and uh, maybe the poor or good te um, technology is all about speed and production. And actually there's points that feed into both the arguments. Um, so I think overall as a group you're covering many of the topics but I'd like to see you just having a, a clearer argument all the way through when you're talking. Equally you did very well. Uh, like very impressive the way you brought out the points and very argumentative, very logical and you had a lot of points to uh, speak about. Very well done and we are looking forward to see more from you all and to really uh, talk on the topic and also use more statistics and of course there are a lot more research done on this topic so to see whether you have really done your homework. I'd like to begin where I left off in the last round. Uh, I talked about how uh, my opponent said that traditional technology makes us self-sustainable, and I gave the example of how Nepal is losing 1.5 billion rupees every day as a uh, trade deficit. I'd also like to uh, point out that Nepal relies heavily on donor nations to keep up uh, its economy. So to say that uh, Nepal is uh, self-sustained just because of traditional technology is not a valid argument, I believe. Uh, I'd also like to uh, point out that uh, my opponent gave an example of ghattas, how traditional ghattas have reduced floods, but imagine a scenario in which instead of cutters, we had huge hydropowers. Not only would they re reduce that flood, uh, but what they would also do is they would give us more electricity yield. So we need to look at that as well. If we had hydropower available instead of cutters, it would be more beneficial to us. So since that is more beneficial, making traditional uh, technology mandatory does not seem like, again, a valid argument. I'd also like to point out how my opponent said that time consumed by traditional uh, technology is nearly equal to uh, that by modern technology just right now. Um, uh, let me give you an example, uh, the Great Pyramid of Egypt. It took 20 years to build that single pyramid, and it took thousands and thousands of slave, uh, slave uh, labor to build that pyramid. So what that shows here is that it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of manpower to build anything using traditional technologies. I'd also like to finally uh, argue that uh, uh, it is not traditional technologies that are used now, that are made mandatory now, that will build our culture. My first uh, opponent talked about how culturally and traditionally uh, traditional uh, uh, equipments are important, but it is not the traditional t uh, equipment that we use now that creates our culture. It is the traditional equipments used in our past that has created our culture. Thank you very much. I agree with the uh, comments. Uh, it was not easy for us because you all have done very well. And there was time that we have to really discuss who the first two are, and then the third and the fourth. So accordingly, uh, the best speaker for uh, today's uh, episode is Prasanna Nayung Tapa becomes the first and second is Tanvi Agrawal and third is Ruchit Shrestha and the fourth is Richan Baral and wish you all the best and especially for those who have come first and second that you will move on to the, the next stage and of course you have a great future forward so it was just neck to neck kind of a competition. Asia superpower, India or China? Let us invite our first debater, Prasanna Jangthapa from St. Xavier's College, starting in grade 12. You will be speaking in favour of India. I'd like to argue that it is not just one country which is an outright superpower. Rather, both the countries have hold a position of a superpower. When they are the largest and the second largest economy in Asia, how can we discard one and disregard one, the other? So, what I'll argue with is that both countries are superpowers. Rather, that the extent of power that India holds, especially in Asia, is greater than the extent of power held by China in Asia. I'll begin with the first thing that defines power, especially in an international scenario, diplomacy. Diplomacy is needed to maintain dominance as well as to exert influence over other countries. And when we look at the diplomatic scenario of China and India, we will not see a more different picture. China, uh, Ch China's diplomacy is of... Um, 
No interference. We remember the case in Syria, right? The whole of the United Nations wanted a peaceful intervention in Syria. What did China do? China vetoed that uh, intervention. Why? Because China believes in a policy of no intervention. India, on the other hand, does not believe in that. Let's give the example of Nepal itself. During the Maoist insurgency, what did India do? India helped the people of Nepal, right? China didn't do anything, although they should both have been equally close to Nepal. So the first point I'm trying to make here is that China does not have the diplomatical know-how of a superpower. And due to that, the power that China holds is lessened. India, on the other hand, believes in diplomacy. And because of that, India's powers are heightened. That's my first point. My second argument is related with national stability. We remember the USSR. Why do we remember the USSR? For its eruption, right, into 23 different countries or something like that. So. When we analyze the Chinese uh, scenario right now, we look at Tibet. We know the case of Tibet, right? It's widely portrayed in general media. But there is also China's largest state, the western province of Xinjiang. According to a BBC report in 2009, over 200 people were killed in that region de uh, during violent protests against government forces. As recent as this May, 31 people died and more than 100 were injured. What does that show? That shows that China does not have the stability of a superpower. That, again, decreases the height of China's power. India, on the other hand, 10 years ago, there would have been so many violent clashes between Muslim and Hindu communities. Now, all of it has subsided. Remember the recent Modi election? There, many Muslims voted for a predominantly Hindu leader and a predominantly Hindu party. What does that show us about India? That shows that in India, national stability is increasing day by day, which heightens India's power, whereas in China, national stability is decreasing, which lessens its power. Then I want to talk about human rights, right? Why do you want to talk about human rights? Because for a country to be powerful, it needs to make sure that its own citizens are happy, right? Without its own citizens being happy, how will a country be powerful? So for the Chinese citizens to be happy, there needs to be a bit of super human rights, right? And China does not respect the human rights of its citizens properly as India does. India is the largest democracy, whereas in China, the first thing that is associated with China is the events of Tanmen Square, right? 25 years ago. So. The point I'm trying to make here uh, is that China does not respect the human rights of its citizens and the citizens in China are not happy. And as its citizens are not happy, China cannot be regarded as a true superpower. Therefore, I'd like to conclude by saying that I've presented to you three basic points in which China is not quite superior, as we'd uh, like to believe, in terms of diplomacy, India is ahead, in terms of uh, national stability, India is more powerful, and in terms of human rights, India is more powerful. Thank you. My opponent made many assumptions and many claims about the Chinese as well as the Indian uh, state. Right. First, she said how the Chinese economy was, uh, sorry, rather the Chinese agriculture sector was better than Indian agriculture sector, yet she refused to give any examples or any fact to support this. My opponent throughout a portion of her debate has made many assumptions like this, uh, such as the health, uh, health uh, state of uh, India being less than that of China, especially health infrastructure. She also talked about how Chinese infrastructure vastly um, uh, precedes that of uh, the Indian uh, infrastructure. And these are assumptions. All of these are assumptions and these have not been supported by any facts. Uh, about her point that the Chinese economy is second largest in the world and this, uh, the Indian economy is the seventh largest in the world, I'd like to make another an adjustment there. That is true according to the World Bank, but that is a, an unfair reflection in India's economy because those are measured according to nominal rates of the GDP measurement. The act according to the uh, GDP measurements by uh, parity, um, uh, by power, uh, spending power parity, uh, the GDP of India is third largest in the world. So uh, to use one set of data and ignore another set of data is completely not fair in this debate. Thank you very much. Prasanna, starting with you, um, you spoke very fast. I can tell you're a little nervous. Um, this isn't going to be the last time you're in front of a camera or speaking in front of people. Take some breaths while you speak. Um, it's going to be more impactful to use fewer words to make your arguments because people will remember that more. So just keep that in mind. Um, I thought when you started out, you wasted a little bit of time um, saying that um, we shouldn't be defining a single superpower. Um, you could have used that time more for argumentation because it was clear what side you had to argue in favor of. Uh, I thought a weakness of your arguments was you relied heavily on political arguments. Uh, diplomacy, uh, political stability, and, and human rights. Um, I think it would have been better if you had chosen a diversity of, of, of topics there. Prasanna, when you speak, you, you have to control the, 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 the speedness of your speaking. Uh, because you speak very, not very, but a li little faster. So I think it is better to, co to control that, that, that speedness. You talk about more politics and which you should include some other other economy, lifestyle. 
and some other 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 issues also. But anyway, it's, it's a good. Prasanna Jang, that's right. You just require a few things to upgrade yourself. You know, the personality, the kind of grooming. All right, you are a young guy right now. You have a lot of scope ahead of you, right? You spoke quite well, but little confidence here and there. It really matters a lot. Fluency is good. You require, you know, more update on economy, GDP, SWOT analysis of the country because you're talking about two countries. Okay, superpower does not mean just. you know the gdp or technology and things like that it consists of a lot of things to be involved out there like for example nuclear power you have tourism you have uh, events which two countries can participate the friendship the kind of uh, you know political uh, involvements of the countries the difference of opinion there are swat which gives you the entire structure which you really require to update Let me first begin with sports. Russia in the Winter Olympics finished both ahead of China and big countries like India. Does that make Russia a bigger power than them? I do not believe that sports is a relevant issue in terms talking while talking about superpower. Then I'd like to talk about science as well. Did you know that till now no person from mainland China has received a Nobel Prize in physics whereas behind the United States and Europe India is the third largest recipient of physics Nobel Prize. What does that make science uh, development in the two countries then? I also want to talk about economics uh, in a broader sense. According to um, uh, World Bank, 30% of Chinese GDP is state-owned uh, state GDP. Right. So what that means is that there is no, there is less incentive for people in China to develop their economy than there is in India. India's economy is uh, profit-based capitalism, right? So suppose I have a billion dollar, right? One billion dollar is just mine, right? So what I'll do with that billion dollar is I'll try to make sure it expands, right? I'll try to make that into two billion dollars. But if I have a billion dollar that's given to me by the government, will I care about that billion dollar? I won't. That's the comparison between China and India. China has a lot of state-owned uh, companies. Its GDP relies a lot on state-owned companies. Whereas in India, this free market capitalism helps India flourish its economy. So, in terms of economy, I do not believe that China and India have a huge disparity. The disparity in economy is very low. And as I talked about in the first half of my debate, the political disparity between these two countries is very high in the favor of India. That is why India is the true superpower in Asia, not. China. I'd also like to talk about Chinese relationship with especially countries like Japan, South Korea, and its own sister state, Hong Kong. There are territorial disputes between China and Japan in the East China Sea. There are territorial disputes between China and South Korea in the South China Sea. What does that mean? China is not happy at some of the biggest powers in Asia. How can it become a superpower when everyone around it is angry at China? That's my point. Thank you very much. I want to begin by talking about the social life in these two countries. In China, there is heavy censorship in television, in media, in the internet. Uh, during the Arab Spring, both Facebook and Twitter were banned in China. Uh, the searching of the word Tanmen Square is censored till now, 25 years after the event. In India, on the other hand, Bollywood, a huge aspect of social life, is the largest film industry in the world. India's press is often regarded as one of the largest in the world. In terms of social life as well, China is vastly outranked by India. So let me conclude here by uh, saying this: politically, India is far ahead of China. Economically, the disparity between China and India is not as high as the surface seems to indicate, because China is a lot more state-owned and India believes in free market capitalism. And finally, in terms of social life, uh, India is far ahead of China. So, what aspect of a superpower, except sports, does China exceed India in? Thank you. The confidence level, I think, as you go on, you can find you know it's improving. Uh, you know, as the time pass, just you know, for uh, Mr. Prasanna, it's just that I'm quite worried about you know your expression. You have a little kind of a setback. Why do you hold behind? Don't hold behind. Push yourself. You know, that's what is required. Prasanna, I found though the the, the topic is very hard and you have to do it within a couple of minutes, but I found slightly improvement than the previous. one it's good anyway so you have you did little progress and i like your some of the points also 
It's good. And I thought those are excellent rebuttals. Uh, Prasanna, you definitely got better in the third and fourth rounds. You started to do your rebuttal, actually, the first segment a little bit, but you didn't have the facts that you had this time around, so I thought that was a, uh, a big improvement, uh, especially the comment about Nobel laureates I thought was, was very clever, and uh, your summation was, was really solid. Among all the runner-ups from the six categories, Prasanna Zangthapa of St. Xavier's College Maitikar has been declared as the winner of Nepal's Top 7 Debaters 2014 in the Category 7 Special Mention.